Friends, I need to start this episode with a sincere apology to our podcast listeners. YouTube people, just chill for a minute because everything was fine for you. You didn't experience any interruption in service. But you who listen to the audio version of this podcast uh, kind of got the short end of the stick last week. We always release on Tuesday, but last week I was out of town. I thought I had everything squared away and ready to go, but apparently I forgot to check like a box. And that meant that the podcast released on Wednesday instead of Tuesday. Our sincerest apologies. That may mean... We are shamed. Yes. You're not on camera right now, so you can be quiet. Okay. The uh, Some of you may have gotten really angry. You might have done property damage, uh, beating your steering wheel, wow. ripping off your mirrors, mm. uh, tearing your headphones apart, whatever you do when you're mad Gashing during a podcast. Teeth, wailing. <laughs> yeah. Again, yeah. you're not on camera. So, <sighs> uh, so I want to apologize for that little faux pas. We meant to release on Tuesday. We just made a little mistake. Actually, I made a little mistake. I'll own that one. Uh, anyway, we'll try to never, ever do that again. But I can't promise we won't. We'll just do our best <laughs> to never do that again. Uh, and that's it. So I want to say sorry for that. A little hiccup. Please forgive us. We know you will. Am I allowed to speak now? And with that, it's another episode hey. of Yes, It's Doable. Yes, It's Discipleship. It's Doable Discipleship with me, Doug Jones. Yeah, Jason and you Whelan. over there. Yeah, Jason Whelan. Here again. I, and I want to start out by Look saying- at Just the duo this week. Just the duo this week, dynamic duo. Let me. But we have an exciting special announcement this week. Doug doesn't even know what we're talking about because oh, somebody geez. has a birthday <laughs> in a couple days. So happy, what is it, 23rd? <laughs> 23rd? 42nd? Uh, this will be my 32nd birthday. There you go, your 32nd birthday. Yeah. So happy birthday. Thanks. Yeah. I actually forgot. I keep forgetting that my birthday is coming because once you get over 30, oh. you stop caring. I don't forget because we have a member on our team who is obsessed with people's birthdays. Yeah, we do. And Vicky. who reminded us. Good old Vicky. So there we go. Yes, well, thanks for that. That's there you very, go. very kind of you, dude. Well, uh, you know, nothing so better to talk, talk about, about on your humanity. birthday but the fall of humankind. <laughs> Let's talk about the moment in time what where a bright everything <laughs> got totally jacked. Um, as you probably know, if you've been listening to, for the last couple of weeks, you've been listening to us uh, kick off this worldview conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, two weeks ago, we talked about uh, what makes a good worldview. Yeah. And I th that episode was entitled, Is Your Worldview Bogus? Here are four questions to figure out. Because Hope you figured it out. Not every worldview accurately accounts for the world that we actually observe. And we got all into that on that episode. So go back and listen a couple episodes back, the Is Your Worldview Bogus episode. But yeah, if you just clicked on this one because you saw something about the fall of humanity. And you're like, yeah, and I want to go. Oh, let's get into that. Go back a couple weeks. Do your get homework. A primer. Do your homework. You know, have the softball lined up for you, and then you can come back here and really swing hard at that. Up yeah, this is like eating dessert before you've had your main course. Go back and do that. We talked about four questions that every worldview needs to answer, and we we're, we're sort of systematically going through those four questions uh, in these subsequent weeks. Last week we talked about how everything came to exist. So a good worldview, so a good picture of reality, which is what a worldview is, needs to account for how things came to be. A little phlegm. That was a moment. <laughs> okay. A little bit of phlegm there. Great. Uh, so it needs to account for how things came to be. Second, it needs to account for why things are the way they are. Mm -hmm. um, so why is the world the way it is and not some other way? Why do we observe things as they are? Why are they the way they are and not otherwise? We'll talk about that a little bit more yeah. deeply in just a moment. I don't want to spoil that. Uh, and then in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about um, how can things, which so clearly are not quite right, be made right? And then how will everything end? So these are four big questions. How did it start? Why is it broken? How can it be fixed? And how will everything end? These are Now, there are other questions that can get folded into worldview discussion, sure. but these are four big ones. If a worldview doesn't account for these four questions, it's not a very good worldview. It's, bogus, it's incomplete. Man. Yeah, totally bogus. So that's what we've been talking about. And today, we're going to be moving into this issue of brokenness. Why is the world the way it is? What we see when we look out into the world, and, and really doesn't matter what perspective you come from or what worldview you hold, uh, I think everybody can look out on the world and agree that things are not as they ought to be. That's why we all have desires for how things should change. That's why we care about political agendas, because we want things to change. We all care about social issues because we want things to change. Uh, when we look out on creation, we see a world that is at the same time gorgeous complex, mm -hmm. uh, a masterful creation, um, something that just boggles the mind in its, in its beauty and in, it, in, it, and in just the, the sheer order and the way it works. 
And yet at the same time, when we look at that very same creation, we see pain and we see sorrow, we see injustice, we see what what a Christian may call evil, what, yeah. what I think most people would actually call evil. We see terrible things being done to humans by humans. We see, um, uh, I, I even think of like the way we, we kind of are slowly and systematically destroying the earth and tearing mm-hmm. down Definitely. the world around us, which seems like culturally we're finally kind of starting to wake up to this idea. But we see a world that is at the same time beautiful, but also very, very broken. And a worldview needs to account for why that is. Yeah, it's one of the big issues that everybody can think, you know, like if if you were to ask any random person on the street, probably like, what is the toughest question about the world that you can think of? Like, I would mm. imagine a good percentage of them would say like, why is there suffering? Why is yeah. there sadness, you know, and pain kind of stuff like that? Why does that have to be? So yeah. any sort of worldview has to talk about it. it any worldview that it. needs to be, any worldview that wants to be taken seriously, has yeah. to deal with this question because it's so huge. It's in all of our faces all the time. It's in your face every time you get sick, it, every time you stub your toe, yeah. every time um, you know some some atrocity is carried out, every time someone's murdered, every mm-hmm. time uh, s- some someone who's weak is taken advantage of by someone stronger. Yep. Uh, all these things playing out are evidence that the world is not as it could or should be. Uh, there are some worldviews that say. The world should not, could not be any different. It just is what it is. Yeah, but you could take a Hobbesian approach, right? And yeah. Life is nasty, brutish, and short. But that's just the universe we live that's in. Just the way and it yet, is. internally, we have the sense that that's not right. We, we have the sense that things ought to be otherwise. We have a longing, as C.S. Lewis would say, we have a longing for something more. And and he he said something interesting. He said, if a person finds himself with an appetite for something that they can't find in this world, it must mean that they were made for something otherworldly. Mm-hmm. It must mean that they were made for something else. And just because we have a longing to see the world made right doesn't necessarily entail that the world will be made right, but it does reveal that we were made for that kind of world. So it's it's the idea that, um, you know, a man could be adrift on a, on a, a raft in the middle of the ocean and have a hunger for bread. Um, now that hunger doesn't mean that he'll ever have bread, yeah. but it does mean that that man was meant to live in a world that had bread yeah. because in our appetites, um, reveal what we were made to have. Yeah. We don't have an appetite for something that we never could or would have. So there's this hun- hunger for us for a perfected world. And yet we, we seem powerless to obtain that kind of world. So mm. we'll talk about how we, how that world can be, can be made in the next couple of weeks. But today we're going to talk about under the Christian worldview, why the world is the way it is. Why is it broken? Yep. Um, every worldview tackles this differently, uh, but this is how the Christian world worldview tackles that. So let's start off talking about the timeline of the fall. How did things go awry in the first place? Yeah. Uh, let's start at the very beginning. A very if, I, if I may to place to start, <sighs> if I may interrupt oh gosh. Uh, one last Getting time. Getting into my song. One but okay. last time. <laughs> oh, is that a song? It's the sound of music. Yes. Yeah, oh, no wonder I didn't know. Oh, okay. Just a um, cultural classic. You you may have heard this narrative before. We're we're going to talk about the the, the sort of the creation and fall of mankind. And if you're a yeah. Christian, you've been a Christian for a while, you've probably heard this narrative before, but we're going to dig into it in a way that you may not have covered before. We're going to try to get into some nuances that you may never have noticed. So try to listen to the story of the fall as we read through the text and we talk mm-hmm. through some stuff. Just try to listen to this with new ears and kind of put yourself into the shoes of Adam and Eve as we talk about them and just just kind of let this story envelop you a little bit and try to experience it in a new way. Yeah, and importantly, it's it's more of like a broader look because we're not just going to look at Genesis. We're going to look at some scripture from other books that still talks about this subject, uh, which maybe you haven't done before. So, And the the reason for that is because this sets up everything subsequent in human history. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, (laughs) there's nobody who's outside this story. Whether you are a Christian or not, you're caught up in this story. If this story is true, you're in it. You're affected. Yeah. Yes, there's no escaping. This is kind of like it's kind of like the creation narrative in that way. It's like mm-hmm. if that's the way things were created, then that has implications for all of us, for every faith background on every continent, no matter what you think. The entirety you're, of you're humanity caught up in it. for and, all time. And this is absolutely exactly the same. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. Timeline of the fall. So we're talking. The first point that we want to talk about is if you remember uh, when we talked about uh, when God made the world and the universe and all things uh, last week. So he he made. The entirety of everything out of nothing, if you remember, and God made a good world is the first yeah. point that we want to talk about here. God, He looks at His creation and He declares <clears throat> it to be good, and He doesn't just say, "Ah, uh, that's good. 
I'm happy yeah. with it. It'll do. It'll yeah. Uh, that's sufficient. <laughs> That'll no, do. He world. said. He said it is good, and he said it seven times in in Genesis one. In Genesis one alone. In Genesis one alone, he says it was good, and then after he made human <clears throat> beings, the Bible tells us it says it, in Genesis one thirty one it says then God looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was very good. Hmm. So God was very happy with what he had made. Doug did a great job of uh, of defining for me the words very and good, so I will read for you what he wrote here. <laughs> well, He's, these are from the Hebrew. So is I this was, what it was? I was breaking you down, broke it down? The, the, okay. what's encapsulated in those Hebrew words. Gotcha. I'm not trying to explain two very simple it's, English <laughs> words to you. Okay, well, whatever. Ding dong. Well, anyway, it says, okay, for very in the Hebrew, I guess, it, uh, it defines it more as exceedingly or abundantly or superfluously. And good is also known as as pleasant, agreeable, excellent, rich, and worthy. So when God makes human beings and he's made all of creation and he declares it very good, there's a lot of meaning there. It yeah. means that God was pleased. It means that he, God, the perfect one, yeah. declared that his creation was worthy of him. Yeah. That's a big, 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 big yeah. meaning pack statement. There was nothing that God was like, uh, I'll get back to that. <laughs> yeah. There was no yeah. moment of, of well, I kind of slacked off a little bit on this. No. Yeah. God, as, a rough as, Doug said, as Doug said, the perfect one made everything, said it was very good. It was as he wanted and desired it to be, right? It yeah. was a wonderful and spotless a reflection of his glory. Think about that. God, yeah. who is perfect, who is sovereign, right? Who, it, him and his glory, he made the world, he made all of creation, he made us he, he, as humans, and he was happy with it. Yeah. Like, that's incredible to think about. It's important that, that we're given this picture too because it helps us to realize the discrepancy between the world that we are in now mm -hmm. and the world that God initially made. This sets up, this sets up the gap. Yeah. Um, it helps us to see that the world that God intended, yeah. uh, the world that God made initially, uh, is a far cry from the world that we live in today. And it's it true. sort of it sort of accentuates the fall that we're about to to look at. Well, and that's and that's one of the key points here is we can't even imagine yeah. what that place would have been like. We can't imagine a world <laughs> without pain, without evil, without yeah. a brokenness and sadness and like you. You know, you think about this term like utopia or whatever, and you may have some sort of vision for it, but like what we talked about, like when God made everything out of nothing and how you can't even fathom that, it's probably impossible to fathom a place where sin had never existed. Yeah. That God was, it was good, and God was happy, and we were, or Adam and Eve were in good relationship with God. Yeah. And it was just, it was... It, like uh, the world has taken the word good and kind of lessened what it means because now yeah. good like on a report card is a b right <laughs> yeah but but back then god like good was good yeah it was god's there was, good it was god's good exactly yeah. it didn't e it didn't even have to be that god said it was great no good was good enough and that was yeah. all it needed to be yeah which was which was pretty cool yeah i think a, a, a another interesting element was this idea of harmony that that all that God made, God made a creation that interlocked with the, with each component of creation interlocked perfectly with the others. Like there was no there was no strife between human beings and the world that they inhabited. Yeah, right. I mean, uh, I guess we'll touch well, on that a little bit in the in next the point, universe they inhabit. In the like, universe, if you think right. about it, yeah, is God made everything to set it up perfectly yeah. so that we could live perfectly on this world that he created perfectly. And you still see the remnant of that, that within this vast cosmos, we're on this oasis mm -hmm. of habitability yeah. that yet we have not found any other place. Doesn't mean that there isn't a place out there that might be habitable, but we don't know of any other place like that. And so even in this fallen place, God's still given us this protected place to live. But um, we definitely don't have the same degree of harmony with the earth or with the cosmos yeah, no. as, we, as we once had. Yeah, so so God made everything and he and he said it was good. He was happy with it. Yeah. Our next, phase one. Yeah. Our next phase is that God placed the world under the authority of free creatures, that's us, who mm -hmm. were made in his image. 
right? This is a key thing. So we want to hit this first with some scripture. In Genesis 1, 27 to 28, it says, so God, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Mm. Right? So human beings were made morally perfect and free from sin. Like, we have to keep that in mind, right? When God made us, he made us good. We were not made as a corrupted being yeah when god formed adam and eve it was good and he gave and he gave adam and eve rule over the rest of creation yeah right and which which again so we still see elements of that today like we we see that to an extent human beings have subdued the earth Mm -hmm. um and yet at the same time this the the earth after the curse which we'll talk a little bit about later um has also become kind of a wily and rebellious place where Mm -hmm. uh, on the one hand, we've subdued the earth by means of force where God intended us to- Not the harmony that we- To reflect his goodness in creation, that we were meant to be a reflection of his own image, that we were were sort of his um, under rulers in this creation, that we were meant to be overseers, that in in the very beginning, God made Adam and Eve to be the caretakers of this creation, to be overseers, um, sort of- you know, um, just caretakers of all that he had made. Um, so we're given this authority, but with it a responsibility, and with it all the goodness that was necessary to rule it in a godly way. Mm-hmm. Instead, what we see this is a lack of harmony. There's this, um, there's an unsustainable way that human beings exist on this earth, and, uh, and and I feel like now, because we're able to explore and to understand this world better, we're starting to realize just how much harm we've actually done to it. <laughs> and it's easy to see human beings, while they may have subdued like much of the animal kingdom and that kind of stuff, we also have lost a lot of control over it, where there's natural disasters that happen. Yeah. It seems like the earth itself rebels against us at times. Uh, so this harmonious governing that human beings were made for has broken down. It's all a result of the fall, which we're going to touch on in a moment. But, And I think um, one of the big things that changed for us, and this is something that I don't think we've talked about before, but we can, is this idea, is, is our instinct changed in how we relate with the world. Yeah. You know, originally, Adam and Eve's instinct was purely to be in perfect relationship with the world because that's yeah. how God had made them. That's all they had known. And, and, we'll, yeah. and we'll talk about that. And now our instincts have changed. And so our instinct on how we relate to the earth and the rest of creation is different than yeah. what it was. Yeah, we relate oftentimes violently and, um, and tyrannically over this earth where we were meant to rule lovingly and harmoniously. Yeah. Uh, and the flip side, if, if we look at the curse, which we're not going to reference the exact the actual passage, but we can talk a little bit about the curse later. The curse that God placed on Adam was that the earth would no longer bend to your will, essentially. Yeah. He said, from now on, by the sweat of your brow, you will scrape a living the from toil. the earth. Mm-hmm. It will withhold its fruits from you. It will not easily yield all of its blessing to you the way it used to. The earth will now resist you, and it will be by, it will be with great labor that you make a living here on this earth. Mm-hmm. And we still see that curse oh, yeah. echoing down to this day. So it's this, you, you, so now human beings, because of sin, treat the earth contemptibly, and the earth in turn resists mankind. So we don't live in that harmonious place anymore. And that's one of the things that we can't even imagine what it, what, what it would have been like in the garden when everything was working in harmony together. It's just, it's so out of our frame of... And it's that very truth. I mean, if you take this biblical account to be true, it's that very truth that makes a Darwinian mindset possible. It, it's yeah. actually that that fuels a Darwinian mindset because sure. the thinking is that everything that exists and, and the animal kingdom is a result of the chaotic and violent process of natural selection. Mm-hmm. Whereas the Christian worldview would say, that's not at all how God, like death and and violence was never a part of God's initial design. Yeah. That's that's a marring of what God made. Man, we got to pick up the pace. I know, I'm <laughs> it's sorry. It's a super long episode. But there's, this it's also tantalizing. Awesome, all great stuff. Um, Sonny, I just want to end that section by talking about, so um, 
So when God made humans, he made us with free will. And we've talked about that a little bit before, but it's yeah. just that, they, that, that if they chose to, if Adam and Eve chose to, they could rebel against God. Yeah, it they, was, had, they had it in them to be able to choose the opposite. Yeah, it was kind of like implicit with free will comes the ability to, to choose either good yeah. or choose evil, to choose God or choose to walk away from God. That's yeah. the sort of like a... It's just a necessary facet of, of free will. So up to this point, you're picturing God who made a, a good world. You're picturing good creatures, mm-hmm. uh, but creatures who are morally free, who are placed, uh, who are placed in that world, uh, and given authority over that world. And um, it sounds like the time is ripe for a villain. It almost sounds like in, if, if you were writing a movie or something, if you're writing a screenplay, it sounds like yeah, it's time to introduce antagonist. That Come antagonist. on in. Which takes us to number three. Uh, number three is that an evil entity emerged. And this, this character is shrouded in much mystery. There's much we know about him. There's a lot we don't know about him as well. Uh, but we're going to examine here a little bit about what, what the Bible says. But if we go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, uh, we get this character introduced for the very first time. It says this, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. Uh, which raises questions of who is the serpent? So it's this critter that shows up um, and begins this conversation with Adam and Eve that we're going to get into in a moment, or at least a conversation with Eve. Yeah. The Bible seems to imply that Adam was present as well. Uh, but we introduce the serpent, and um, there's some talk about this. The, the The Genesis 3 text doesn't say that this is Satan, but if we look at the whole of Scripture, it seems pretty clear that um, traditionally Christians have always held that that was Satan, mm-hmm. um, the personal evil, the fallen angelic being, uh, formerly called Lucifer, at least sometimes called in the Bible Lucifer. Uh, we'll talk about who he was in a minute, but it seems pretty clear that that's who that was. If we look at Revelation uh, chapter 12, um, Satan is referred to as that serpent of old, which mm-hmm. kind of sounds like a pretty clear illusion. Uh, Jesus also called Satan the father of lies, and this is the f- Satan. Uh, this serpent tells the first lie ever recorded, so yeah. it se- seems like... Thanks for spoiling yeah, that does my seem next like, section, but yeah. That does seem like the father of lies, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then we 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 get some other allusions to him in the Old Testament that we'll we'll talk about in just a moment. But um, Lucifer, kind of the the pre fall and name of of Satan, mm-hmm. um, uh, is 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 a reference that we get in Isaiah fourteen twelve. The word Lucifer is used there in some translations, which means light bearer or shining one or morning star. Some call it son of the morning. Mm-hmm. Um, it's this picture of this radiant, glorious, angelic being. Um, probably, um, if, if we read, as we're going to read in just a minute from Ezekiel 28, um, it, it, there's, there's good reason to believe that, um, that Lucifer was what we would call the archangel, the, the chief angel, as he's sometimes called, prior to Michael the archangel, who's referred to in the Bible. It seems mm-hmm. that after Satan, uh, formerly known, the artist, the angel formerly <laughs> known as Lucifer, known, yeah. before he fell, he, he reigned as, uh, it seems the supreme angel, um, who was called the guardian of God's glory, and yet he fell. And we're going to read a very interesting, and um, I, I just find a very fascinating account of Satan's fall, which comes from Ezekiel chapter 28. And it, this is actually a double layer passage that mm-hmm. talks about the king of Tyre, um, when uh, the prophet Ezekiel was doing kind of an oracle, an oracle against the nations, which you can read later. Um, but it's clear that these words go well beyond any yeah. human king and take us into the realm of of angelology and, and this supernatural story of of the fall of of Satan. <clears throat> Here's what it says. It's very, very powerful stuff. It's Ezekiel 28, 12 through 17. It says, speaking of, this is God uh, speaking to Ezekiel saying, say this mm-hmm. um, and say this to to the king of Tyre who's standing as as a as a placeholder for Satan. It says, God speaking of Satan, you were the model of perfection full of wisdom and exquisite in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. So pretty clear. Hello. The king of Tyre, the human king of Tyre was not in Eden, the garden of God. The serpent, however, was. He says, your clothing was adorned with every precious stone, red carnelian, pale green peridot, white moonstone, blue green beryl, uh, onyx green jasper, blue lapis lazuli, turquoise and emerald, all beautifully crafted for you and set in the finest gold. They were given to you on the day you were created. I ordained and anointed you as the mighty angelic guardian. You had access to the holy mountain of God and walked among the stones of fire. Which we don't know what those are, but it sounds like a really cool, interesting. (laughs) It's like a really cool heavenly depiction of God's dwelling. 
said you were blameless in all you did from the day you were created until the day evil was found in you. Your rich commerce led you to violence and you sinned. So I banished you in disgrace from the mountain of God. I expelled you, O mighty guardian, from your place among the stones of fire. Your heart was filled with pride because of all your beauty. Your wisdom was corrupted by your love of splendor. So I threw you to the ground. This is interesting. And this is, this is an aspect, super interesting this is an aspect of, um, of the angelic realm that I think even a lot of Christians have never really noticed before or read before or, or gained any understanding of, but Lucifer is being described here, an angel uh, who was the first creature to rebel against God, uh, the, first, the first created thing who did evil. Mm-hmm. He was made, as he's called in this passage, the mighty guardian of God's glory, um, but instead, uh, as, a, as the supreme angel, he fell prey to pride. Pride sort of arose in him. He became, rather than as he was meant to be the guardian of God's glory uh, and sort of uh, an attendant to God, he became infatuated with his own splendor and his own beauty. Um, that he, rather than protecting the glory of God, became so infatuated with that glory that he sought to steal that glory for himself. That he actually set out, it appears, to dethrone God. Hmm. Very stupid when you think <laughs> about it. <laughs> but, nice try. But I, I, I think... Um, it's it's because it, I've always wondered like okay if you were an angel and you dwelt so closely with God why on earth would you ever think yeah. like you you would think that he would know better than anyone what a fool's errand that was but I think that's a picture of what pride can do yeah I think absolutely. that's a picture of of the kind of warping of reality that that pride can create um, the book of Revelation says that Lucifer corrupted an army of angels it said that uh, with his tail he swept a third of the stars out of the sky which most scholars think is a is an allusion to him leading a third of all the angelic hosts that God had made, leading them into a rebellion against God. Crazy. Yeah. So there's this, don't ever fall into the trap if you're a Christian of thinking that this world is all that there is. Don't think that this terrestrial flesh and bones place, I mean, the New Testament talks about this a lot, that there is an entire realm of existence. There is this angelic realm, the spiritual realm that is probably every bit as complex as the world we live in and every bit is real. uh, And yet, goes largely unseen to our eyes. It's, it's Also, don't it, think that you are void of being able to fall in, into yeah. temptation. Don't, you are not immune. Yeah, like a third of the angels who were in God's presence yeah. still fell to, to, you know, to uh, is Satan's temptation. Creation is not just populated by humans and animals. It is populated by powerful angelic beings that are worth noticing. <laughs> like it's worth paying attention to. Yeah. Um, and it, it seems that when Satan fell... Um, a, a lot of scholars think that Satan, who was the possibly or probably the previous archangel, was replaced by Michael, mm-hmm. uh, who became the archangel that's referenced many times, both in the Old Testament and the New Testaments. And there's even a confrontation between Michael and uh, and Satan in the book of Jude. Um, but we also find that there was this great battle where where Michael and the faithful angels clashed with Lucifer and the fallen angels, those who yeah. chose to, to betray and turn on God. Uh, and ultimately, there was this great battle in heaven that Revelations chapter 12 talks about. And um, the Bible tells us that Michael and the faithful angels overcame Satan and the fallen angels and that they were ultimately cast out of heaven, which we read in Ezekiel 28. And we should note that Michael is not John Travolta as played in the movie Michael. <laughs> no, should, he does not line we dance. We should clarify that. In a trench, jack, in yeah, a trench just, coat. Just no. want to clarify that. <laughs> Please. Thank you. Yeah. Travolta in a in a mullet <laughs> <laughs> with with tattered wings. Perfect example of Michael the Archangel. Yeah, yeah Michael is an extraordinarily powerful, and, and someday we're going to do an episode on angelology <sighs> and get into this more because it's just yes. so tantalizing and just so interesting. Um, but we do know that there was this great battle and that Michael was able to overcome um, Lucifer and the fallen angels with the help of, of course, God and and those on his side. So Lucifer, we now refer to as Satan or the devil. Satan means adversary. So um, that's a very common New Testament mm-hmm. word that's used for him because he is the enemy of God and all that God loves. So um, it kind of answers the question, like when we get to the next chapter of the story, why does Satan go after Adam and Eve? It's because Satan hates God. Satan sought out to replace God, to dethrone God and was cast out. His, his whole agenda is to destroy God, though he can never do that, he then directs his attention to those who God loves, human beings, this precious, flawless creation that God made. He mm-hmm. sets out to, to, to tear it down. 
and uh, we we kind of enter into that on the next on the next uh, bit of it. But uh, one quick question that I don't know that we can handle in a quick way. <laughs> it would take oh, quite a while. But l- let me just touch on this because I think it's such an I just think it's such an unavoidable question because the the, the scriptures tell us that Satan rebelled, he was cast out, uh, and that he was cast down to earth, mm-hmm. and that Satan now roams the earth. That he he is constantly prince of, world, right? prince of this world. He's constantly motoring around doing his dirty dirty work and seeking to destroy what God loves. The question arises, why, having rebelled in heaven, would he be cast down to earth, the realm of these innocent humans that God had made? You know, like, why not throw him into the lake of fire, you know, that eternal place of separation, right from the get? Just send him to Mars. (laughs) Just throw him, like, (laughs) way out there. Put him into a black hole or something. Like, why, why let him inhabit the world with these creatures that God had declared good and that he loved? And we have to kind of wrestle with that a little bit. We know that Satan didn't force his way into the garden because no angelic being could overpower our um, yeah, omnip- our omnipotent God. Like yeah. he couldn't he couldn't overpower God and get into the garden by force. We know he couldn't have snuck in under God's radar because God would have known. Like God's an <laughs> omniscient God. Yeah. There's nothing that escapes his notice. So there's no way that he could have snuck in. Uh, why on earth would would God let that happen? And it seems that with the role that Satan ultimately plays in the garden, um, Satan made it possible for Adam and Eve to, through what he does, which we'll get into next, Mm -hmm. that that makes it possible in a very real way for Adam and Eve to actualize their free will, Mm -hmm. to either choose to obey the clear command of God regarding the tree, which we'll get to, or to believe Satan instead and rebel against God ultimately. Yeah. Um, and and there's there's different schools of thought whether Adam and Eve would have ultimately fallen and disobeyed God on their own or whether they would not have and whether Satan, what Satan does is necessary to that fall. Um, different schools. Of different schools of thought. People yeah. think differently on that. But what we do know is what the Bible tells us. Yep. And that's the story that we're going to continue to tell now. So why don't you take us into step four? Yeah. So we got to hear all about... Um, or at least <laughs> what a we know about, about Satan. Yeah. <laughs> um, so now we get to the part where uh, a lie is told. And we're going to jump right into Genesis 3, 1 through 5, where it says, One day he asked of the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. Can I... You can interject can I just, scripture if you want. Can yeah. I just interject that? <laughs> I just think it's really interesting the approach that the serpent takes here. And I think we can safely call him Satan. Yeah, the, question is, mm-hmm. the, the question is very interesting because in the latter half of this, he turns into an authority, which we're going to get to in just a minute. He, yeah. he takes an authoritative stance on God's command and actually... Says that's not true. Yeah. Retracts God's command. Mm-hmm. But he starts off with a very, with almost a naive question. Did God really say you can't eat from any trees of the garden? Which is actually a travesty of God's original generous command. God Mm -hmm. gave them everything for their own enjoyment. And he just said, from this one piddly tree, you may not eat. Satan's a deceiver, man. Satan is a master. Even back then, this relatively inexperienced Satan was was a master (laughs) of deception. It's easy to see why he earns the name Father of Lies. But Mm -hmm. he starts with a very, almost a childish question. Did God really say you can't eat from any trees? Like, and basically, any saying, tree in the did, God, b- did God doom you to starve? Yeah. So he begins with this very seemingly sloppy lie mm-hmm. or, or sle- seemingly sloppy question, but it builds c- very craftily as we go. Oh, yeah. So, so Eve responds. Uh, yes. So, so, so she says that God said you must not eat it or even touch it. And that's talking of the tree in the middle of the garden that they're not allowed to eat. Which God did not say you can't touch it, by the way. She that's added true. that. That's true. We don't know why. Um, if you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent re- replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. Now, this... That's that, the sheer blatant lie right there. That is, yeah. uh, people, like, say, the serpent did not merely tempt them by saying like, oh, it's not that bad, come yeah, over. Yeah. He flat, flat out, out yeah. he flat out negated God's warning with his lie. You 
won't die. God said you will die. He said yeah. you won't die. It's a blatant lie. Some people say like, well, they didn't die immediately. So there was kind of some truth in that. I'm like, <laughs> it's not well, like it was poison. Whatever. I mean, just, yeah, no. Okay. They, sure. it, it doomed them. It led them to death. Yeah. But, and, but the second part is actually a truth. God knows that your eyes sure. will be open as soon as you eat it. And their eyes were, as we'll see. But they, it didn't make them like God. Yeah. Um, I think we'll, yeah. So, so he, here's what Satan does it, 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 as he's telling this lie. Well, what he's doing is he minimizes the consequences and exaggerates all the benefits. Yeah. Right. He negates God's warning in his lie, which we just talked about. Right. So just try to imagine, put yourself in Adam and Eve's shoes in this time. Right. Uh, they had never been lied to. They wouldn't have even known what a lie was because all they knew was what God had told them. They trusted God because they had no reason not to. They had never encountered any malicious creature no, before. There was nothing to suggest ill will or bad intention or anything. No, no. They had never built up any skepticism toward no, any creature nothing. or anything. And, and why should they? Yeah, completely and utterly innocent. I would say, think about the naivete of a child, but it's even more so than that because, yeah. because it had just never even existed. Yeah. Right? It's like when you tell a three-year-old, don't eat, don't eat watermelon seeds because a watermelon will grow in your stomach, and they go, what? what? Really? And, and you've just successfully scared that child into never consuming a pumpkin seed. I remember yeah. being genuinely <laughs> scared about that. And, and you've lied to them, yes. <laughs> and they believe it. Yeah. Like, they just take it at I face value. I still don't eat watermelon seeds for that reason. The innocence of a child. But as you said, you can't even compare them to a child because even a, even children that we know are still born yeah, they're sinful still corrupted, creatures yeah. like, like we are. Exactly. So just complete and perfect innocence. Yeah. And what happened here is that Satan just explicitly exploits that innocence. Yeah. He knows how innocent they are. He knows that they have never experienced a, a lie they've never you know had reason to question a you know anything that they've been told yeah and so they believe it right so yeah. you know it's it's a whole it, it, is you can feel for the in the story but the point is is that they were free creatures yeah and, and, and as we'll get into satan they, did not yeah satan did not diminish their free will no, no, no. He didn't take away their right to choose. What he did was, by lying, present a conflicting option. And so now these creatures made in God's image and and yet and, and possessing free will yeah. were faced with now a very real choice. Like who will you believe? Mm -hmm. The serpent or God? That's what it comes down to. It's all it comes down to. Now, now, prior to that, you can you can say like, would they or wouldn't they have sinned on their own? All we know is they never sinned until the serpent showed up. The serpent shows up, lies to them, and then they sin. So whether free will would have caused them to sin ultimately on their own, we don't know. But I, I, there's there's nothing to suggest that sin would have ever occurred to them on their own. All we know is it didn't happen. All we know is it just didn't happen before Satan did. The fact it. of the matter is we don't know how long either that they had been in the garden before the serpent showed up. We the, the remember Bible, there's no there's no God gives there. Adam the task of naming the animals before he even creates you. So mm -hmm. it's it seems to me likely because it, it seems like like Adam had done the job of naming creation uh, naming the animals if you read even before back, he, yeah, before he, he was even because it was after naming the animals that that there was this moment where Adam where where God looked at Adam and said it's not good that man should be alone. Yeah. So Adam may have been alone on the earth for a thousand years or more. And he and Eve together might have been on the earth for a thousand years or more, though I doubt it because they probably would have had offspring by this time if that had been the case, if they had been together on earth for that period of mm -hmm. time. The point is, we don't know how long they existed in this blissfully good state. Yeah. We just know that as soon as the serpent shows up, mm -hmm. bam, it changes. It happens. And, and I don't know, I guess we can quickly touch on the idea, like why aren't they freaked out about the fact that a snake is talking to them? Um, yeah, you know, some people say like, as a, it was some other like greater mythical creature, maybe it was like a lizard or like a, even like a dragon. Cause there's sometimes these dragon words used, but the Hebrew word is the word nakash, which literally just means snake. It doesn't mean anything fancy. Mm -hmm. It's just snake. So it raises the question like, why aren't Adam and Eve like, Hey, you're a snake. Yeah. <laughs> like, wait a second. <laughs> what did I just eat? It's <laughs> well, not working. Like, did I eat the wrong mushroom? Or yeah, what? exactly. <laughs> um, but we don't know what a typical experience. Remember, we never have lived in this perfect world. Yeah. And it's pretty likely that Adam and Eve had regular interactions with angelic beings. Like, mm -hmm. why would they not? Um, and it could be that 
spiritual angelic beings may have frequently taken the form of animals in order to commune with Adam and Eve. We just don't Possibly. know what was normal for them and what was abnormal. No so for them, an animal... It's Dr. Doolittle. An animal speaking to them, <laughs> uh, you know, an, an angelic creature speaking to them in the form of an animal may have been totally normal and they may not have been freaked out by them. All or, we know is that they didn't flee and run away. They didn't be like, oh, you know, talking snake. Or yeah. take the garden hoe and start bashing it. Yeah. Like, no, I don't think that it was normal for snakes to talk back then. I, I think, but I do think it may have been perfectly typical for them to have had conversations with angelic creatures in the garden. Yeah. Why wouldn't they? Uh, anyway, so we can speculate on that. I know that all sounds really weird and crazy, but again, we're talking about a world that is a far cry from what we it's now true. inhabit. And, we're, and we, we live in a world where the relationship between God and man has been so deeply wounded yeah. And broken, so now we don't have the same communion with God and with with angelic creatures that we that we were once meant to have, um, and that we will one day have again. So yes, a lie was told. Step four. Anything you want to say on that before we move on? Uh, no. Okay, we really must move on. <clears throat> yeah. Step five is that a lie was told, and then we get into step five. A decision was made. In the end, Adam and Eve were, still had a legitimate choice to believe either God or the serpent. And here we read Genesis 3, verses 6 through 7. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it, and she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were open, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. And it actually goes on to say uh, in a couple of verses later that they fled into the trees when, when God approached. So in the end, Adam and Eve, as you were saying, made a willfully disobedient choice. Mm-hmm. They, their free will was in no way overwhelmed by Satan's lie, um, but it was really made explicit. Like their free will now became a very real option between yeah. A and B. <clears throat> Again, you could say that that option was always there as long as the tree was present, but we know that they never decided to disobey until the lie was given. In the end, they believed the serpent over the clear command of God. And and they experienced, as, this, as these verses tell us, an immediate internal change. Mm-hmm. There is now this sudden rush of shame, a feeling that they had never felt before. No. They covered themselves. It says that they covered their private parts, which is interesting, and that could be talked about at length, yeah. I think, by by theologians. But um, they didn't just cover them, their parts, they actually fled into the trees and hid themselves. So it seems to me that they were hit with this rush of a general feeling of unworthiness, Mm -hmm. the sense that they had done wrong and they were no longer fit to stand in God's presence. Um, Because what, what then happens is it says that in the cool of the day when God was walking through the garden calling out to them, they hid themselves. So it wasn't just like, oh, cover your top and bottom or anything Ah. like that. It was like... Like, I can't it be, was, I don't want him to see me. They were hiding their very selves. Mm-hmm. They were trying to shield their very being from God, who they now felt, prob- I'm sure to them it felt quite vague, but they had this sense that they could no longer stand comfortably in God's presence, a feeling that they had never had before. They had never even been conscious mm-hmm. of, their, of, of their own nakedness. Um, and it's this picture of innocence lost, mm-hmm. you know? Totally. Uh, and God asked them this question when they hide in the trees, you know, they say, we heard you coming and we were afraid uh, because we were naked. Yeah. And God said, who told you you were naked? It's crazy. A really interesting question. Yeah. And and it it's as if God said, who said something was wrong with you? Mm-hmm. And he immediately asked them, did you eat from the tree? Of course, God knew did you what do happened. It? Yeah. <laughs> and you had this, in, this really um, heartbreaking parental moment where God said, did you do the thing I told you not to do? And then we get into that moment where they lie. They chocolate accuse all over your fingers. Yeah. You, uh... Adam accuses Eve. Eve accuses the serpent. And God issues his his curses mm-hmm. to the serpent. He said, I'm, I'm dooming you to, to crawl on your belly for all your life. Yep. You will strike at the heel of Eve's offspring and she will crush your head, And which, is, which we Alluding. pretty clearly think alludes to God's, Christ's ultimately def, ultimate defeat of Satan on the cross and with his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, to the man, or to the, to the woman, he says, I'll sharpen the pain of childbirth mm-hmm. um, and that whole thing. Um, and then there's also the, the strife between man and woman that he prescribes um, and when he speaks to Eve. Yeah. And then to Adam, he says, from now on, this earth will, re- will rebel against you and it will be with great trouble that you make a living here. Um, but there's this, there's this huge shift that happens internally 
and then externally as well. God ultimately uh, cast them out of the garden, which we'll we'll talk about next. We want to take us into yeah, to and that's six. the disaster that we're talking about. So you know, with choice comes this consequence, and so disaster s- strikes them. Yeah, like when they betrayed God, <clears throat> it wounded their relationship with God. Like just yeah. it, 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 it was it's what it was. Is 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 they could never be in that perfect relationship that they could have before because now they knew how to do wrong. Yeah. Right? They could never stand at ease before God yeah, in the same never. way again. Mm-mm. Yeah. And they became accursed, which we had talked about, and were doomed to die like we were talking about. You know, God, he bars them from the tree of life. And, yeah. he, and you know... A, a big reason he does so is that because he doesn't want us to live forever in a broken world with our pain and with the suffering, you know, that yeah. sin, th- th- which comes from sin. Yeah, we forget but, that those two trees sat together mm-hmm. in the middle of the garden. Yeah. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree, tree of life. life. You, you want to read the Genesis 3, uh, 22 to 24 passage? Because this kind of lays it out. It says... And then the Lord God said, look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out and and take fruit from the tree of life and eat it? Then they will live forever. So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden, and he sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. After sending them out, the Lord God stationed the mighty cherubim, to the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Yeah. Um, I would love to see what that looked like. It'd be a flaming sword flashing back and and forth. forth. Yeah, whatever all this imagery is, we know that God... um, He barred them. God, yeah, God completely eliminated the possibility of them returning to the garden and ever eating from the tree of life again, at least... At until, least till rev- yeah. until the end, um, which we'll get to, and that's yeah, and that's really interesting. We'll we'll talk more about that um, in, in the last week, but this tree of life um, seems kind of like a footnote, and I think it gets easily overlooked. Oh yeah, but the tree of life seems to be whether allegorical or literal. I think literal, um, if you want my two cents, just because of the style of of the writing of Genesis chapter three. Um, you you have this. Um, it's essentially a picture of God's continuation of human life mm-hmm. and that God, when mankind falls, withholds the continuation of human life. And now death slowly starts sinking in. Illness arises and all these things we'll talk about in just a moment. But God now withholds eternal life from human beings and death and death yeah. begins to occur. Um, and it continues to occur to this day. And it actually seems like a merciful yeah, like a merciful act mm-hmm. on God's part, saying, "I, I, and you cannot bear to live in this fallen state forever. I can't bear yeah. to let you live in this fallen state forever." Um, so God withholds life from them, um, so that at least in in time there will be an end to their to their, mm-hmm. you know, to that wickedness and to the death that comes. Um, and so we have the results. Uh, I'll just go through these plainly. Um. From the time of the fall on, the world became full of things like pain and illness, death, ultimately, as we've already said, evil, uh, all sorts of atrocities, violence, mismanagement of the earth, which we've talked about, which I think is, a, is an understated thing, um, but very, very important. Uh, of course, separation from God, a, a brokenness in the relationship between us and Him, which leads to a lack of purpose and obviously a ultimate death. Um, and then even hell, hell itself is the place of final separation that results because human beings fell. Um, Jesus c- calls the lake of fire or or that eternal place called hell, uh, the place that was made for the devil and his mm-hmm. angels. It wasn't made for human beings, but because human beings fell just as those angels did, they're doomed to that same place of separation. Yeah. By choosing separation, separation from God, God gives separation. Uh, hell is a fulfillment of of the choice, not God's choice, but of the human choice and of the angelic choice to rebel. Yeah. Um, so uh, what we're saying here is is not trying to give a comprehensive list, but what we're saying is all the bad all things. Bad, yeah. <laughs> every bad. Every, sing- every single thing that's wrong with the world, everything that is not a reflection of the very good world yeah. that God himself declared, mm-hmm. you know, that God himself made, everything that is 
not part of that goodness is a result of the fall. It was in this moment when the when the rulers of this earth decided to turn from God, it created this cascading effect of brokenness that went downstream, mm-hmm. where now we're, f- we're surrounded by this world that seems, uh, like we said earlier, so beautiful and so wonderful, and yet um, it's just so screwed up. Yeah. And, and I, th- I don't think any of us from any worldview perspective can deny the, the brokenness of the world that we live in. We may have different ways of explaining the brokenness, yeah. And justifying the brokenness Everybody or whatever, knows but there's this there's sense that it's, it's not right. You yeah. know, like you can say you can you can say what you want about what you believe, but at the same time, you cannot get around that feeling of just inescapable rage that you feel when some terrible human atrocity or human rights violation happens and mm-hmm. gets on the news. Like you can't help but feel like something's wrong when you're sick or when a loved one dies. I mean, you just can't get around this gut level self-evident truth that things aren't as they ought to be and and the christian worldview explains that there's this there is there was this event long ago yeah. that began this you know long chain of of brokenness and sadness fun right yeah that ended great uh, <laughs> um but it's it's the it's 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 the truth and again and this isn't the end of the conversation that story doesn't end and that's there. the important point so next week we're going to be uh, talking about the next phase of what a worldview, a at least a good worldview, should talk about, which is how can that brokenness be fixed? Right. Um, and so we're going to talk about that with a Christian perspective uh, next week. But a couple of doable steps that we want to share with you guys, of course, every week that you guys can do uh, this week at home. There's a book by C.S. Lewis. Uh, Doug mentioned, or he mentioned a quote from it earlier. It's It's called The Problem of Pain. Um, which talks about basically what we've been talking about with the a concept of suffering and pain and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, so highly encourage that. Yeah. Um, by but, the way, if yeah. when you read that, the, the problem of pain is often brought to the table as a critique of Christianity. Like, so how mm-hmm. can a good God uh, have created a world that's filled with pain? But actually, the Christian perspective is actually... Um, bolstered by the issue of pain, mm-hmm. and 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 yeah. the Christian response to that is actually very very robust and strong. We've touched on some of it today, True. but yes, the problem of pain by C.S. Lewis is a, a very very is just a masterful work on yeah. that. Yeah. Another thing, quickly, we wanted to mention a website. We don't often mention websites, but we wanted to mention one. So there's one yeah. called gotquestions.org, I believe is yeah, the, yeah right so. dot org, um, and it's it's just a very it has literally thousands and thousands of question and answers, almost anything that you can think of in the Christian mindset Mm -hmm. like and so it's really interesting if you want to go and look up some of these questions about like the garden of eden about the tree of life a whole bunch of stuff Mm -hmm. and just see uh, what they say about it um it's a website that we use quite a bit in in different areas and uh so it's a fun one to get lost in for hours and check out all these different sorts of questions it's like youtube where you can just fall down the rabbit hole and go from this question to this question to this question and then you're like what but Unlike YouTube, where you're usually just looking at like mind-numbing nonsense, like <laughs> it's cat videos or whatever, based and great. it's all stuff that's yeah, you're learning biblically. Not every question, not every answer on there is perfect. No, I would say, I mean, but I'd agree. but again, it's a great, it's, it's a, a great it's a thought-provoking point. place to get started, and um, you can spend five minutes on that site and come away. I do this still all the yeah, time. Me too. You can spend five minutes on that site and go away going like, "Whoa, I understand this better than I did before." Well, like, I had I never now even have a broader asked that question before. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, you'll have a lot of fun with that. So check it out. Yeah, and come back next week. Don't miss next week's discussion. Don't don't end <laughs> with the brokenness and fallenness of the world. Come back for the restoration. Come back for for the end of the story. The hope uh, in the coming weeks. The hope that lies yeah. ahead. We don't want to end it here. Oh, uh, and and of course we invite you to to reach out to us. Send us an email at maturity at saddleback dot com. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, leave a comment below. Feel free to ask questions. Hit, hit the like button. Feel free to argue about these really interesting, thought-provoking things that are raised with the Garden of Eden and Satan and the serpent and all this fun stuff. Have fun. Hit the like button. Yeah. Uh, subscribe if you haven't already. For Rate us. Out loud. Give us a rating. Give us yeah. a review. Hey, just be nice to us. We <laughs> like you. Just tell us if you like us back. That's a great way to end it. Be nice to us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, guys. We love you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. If you're a podcast listener and you enjoyed this episode, consider giving us a rating or a review on iTunes. If you do, you'll help other people find us in the future. And if you're thinking, hey, listening's great, but is there a way I can watch these episodes? 
Yeah, there is. Subscribe to the Saddleback Church YouTube channel for video versions of these conversations, plus lots of other video content. And if you're already watching us on YouTube, subscribe to the podcast so you can listen in the car or wherever else you go. Lastly, you can always get in touch with us by emailing maturity at saddleback.com. Send us your thoughts, send us your questions, your Bible questions, your life questions, whatever. Who knows, your question just might inspire an upcoming episode. Thanks again for tuning in to Doable Discipleship. I'm Doug Jones, and I hope you'll join us again next week.